So if you want to call this first lecture anything, you can call it cells. Really, we're going to introduce first humans, and then we'll start to talk about cells, because humans are living organisms, and all things that are living are made up of cells. So let's start first with humans. And since it's a human biology class, it probably would be appropriate to start out and try to define what humans actually are. And we're going to define humans based off characteristics. So what are some characteristics that you attribute specifically to you? What makes humans something specific or something unique, different from all of the other all of the other living organisms on the planet. Wear clothes. You guys have seen chimps that wear clothes. <laughs> so why do we choose to wear clothes? Okay. And we probably also make the decision. At least most of us make the decisions. What's that? Morals. Okay, morals. And both of those things kind of connect into one particular physiological system. Those are decisions. How do we make our decisions? What do we rely on? We rely on our brain. Yep. So we have large brains. Now, if you've ever looked at um, brains, we don't have the biggest brain by mass on the planet. The blue whale has a pretty large brain. The elephant has a pretty large brain. But if you look at the brain in relation to total body size, we have a gigantic brain. In addition to uh, the brain being large relative to body size, we also have a very wrinkly brain. We have these structures in there that are called sulci and gyri. These are those cracks and crevices that you're probably familiar with when you think of a brain. If you look at the brain of other organisms, they're actually really, really smooth. They don't have the same number of sulci and gyri as the human brain does. What these sulci and gyri do for us is they actually increase the surface area that we have, and they increase the amount of neurons that we can pack into our brain. So relative to body size, we have a large brain. When we start to consider those sulci and those gyri, we have a large number of neurons. And the more neurons that we have allows for a higher amount of neurological function. And this behavior of neurological function leads towards what you both have said Things like decisions to wear clothes, a defined morality, which is crippling, by the way, Crush, crushing under the weight of modern ideological thought. That's for a different class. What that, what that leads towards is a high level of complexity. We have societies and buildings and computers that have all been created through human power, brain power. Can anyone think of some other characteristics that make us uniquely human? I have two more that are pretty important. Okay, I'm going to include that in the brain. But if I give you a thumbs up, this guy right here is really important. This is called an opposable thumb. And because we have opposable thumbs, we have the ability to use tools and um, we have fine motor control. So the opposable thumb is really important. <coughs> so what I'm going to say about opposable thumbs here, or one of the things I'm going to say is because we have opposable thumbs, and I'll, I'll define that a little better here in just a second, this allows us to have precise control of our dexterity. So precise control over dexterity. In other words, we can actually write and it makes sense. Now, what does it mean to have an opposable thumb? Okay, so all of you, stick your hand out in front of you. 
you can take your thumb and it opposes every single one of your digits. You can actually touch the tips of all of your other fingers. That's really, really important. If you look at the hand of, let's say, an Abonobo chip, which is considered to be one of the, from an evolutionary standpoint, one of the next organisms in line for humans, their, their hand is very different. Their thumb actually cannot oppose all of their fingers. They can only oppose two of them. So they can't oppose all of them. So they have a, a thumb that's not really an opposable thumb. And if you've ever seen uh, National Geographic specials or PBS, and they'll show chimps, and like, look, he uses a tool, and he's like gripping onto a stick, and he's like sticking it into a termite bottle. That's the best he can do. He's not using a hammer to build any buildings. He's not living in houses or huts. Um, and part of it is just because they don't have the capability to do that. There's one other thing that makes us very uniquely human. And I'm exhibiting it right now. Speech, communication, I'm going to let pump in with the brain. I walk upright. I exhibit what's called bipedalism. Now, I'm sure you've all been in the zoo and you've seen a bear standing up and maybe he can walk around, but he sort of waddles. Penguins do the little. All of those organisms, they have a preference for some other form or some other type of mobility. Humans really are the only organisms that have this capability to move. Even a kangaroo, we'll see like, oh, well, the kangaroo hops, yeah, but it uses its tail with control. And if you've ever seen a kangaroo grazing, it's down on all fours, moving around on all fours. Humans are bipedal. After about 8 to 12 months of age, the rest of our life is going to be on two feet. We're going to move on two feet. So what does bipedalism actually allow us to do? This frees up our hands so that we can do work. We can now carry things. And we can swing hammers and we can do all sorts of things because we have two hands that are always available. We're not always crawling or using those, um, those four limbs for mobility. We can use them for other for other activities. So this is a really short list. We can get into some more of the specifics and we can talk about prefrontal cortex and we can talk about speech, uh, all of those types of things, or communication and all of that. These three areas really wrap up what it means and it's how come we are separated from other organisms on the planet. And so really when we survey this, these three characteristics that make us human really invokes our dominance. If there were other species that had these three characteristics, large frame, the prefrontal cortex, bipedalism, and opposable thumbs, humans would not be the only organism sitting in classrooms sitting in front of desks at a job, business, or healthcare, or whatever the case may be. So that takes care of human. What about biology? I've already given a little bit of a definition of biology. Biology is going to be this, uh, the study of chemistry and physics of living systems. Okay, so we're dealing with living systems applying principles of chemistry, applying the principles of physics to understand biology. And really when you get down to the nitty gritty of biology, what you're really studying is you're studying cells. Now you might be studying those cells individually or as parts, such as the nucleus or the mitochondria, but you're dealing with cells. Or you might be going in the other direction, putting multiple cells together to form a tissue, taking multiple tissues, putting them together as an organ system, as a as an uh, organ, and then multiple organs to an organ system, multiple organ systems to an organism. <clears throat> Whatever the case may be, whether it's the individual cell or parts of cells or the whole organism, you're studying cells and you're studying cellular function when you are studying. Uh, 
So we really have to define cells in order to understand what biology is all about. One of the classic definitions of a cell is it's the smallest living unit. Okay? So the smallest living unit. So if I study just the nucleus, which is where the DNA is stored in the cell, is that a living unit? It's not. I may use it with other or, uh, organelle, mitochondria, the Golgi complex, the endoplasmic reticulum, put all that stuff together, wrap it up, and put it in the bilayer, put it in some water, and I get the cell. But on its own, those individual components are below the small, smallest living unit. Viruses are viruses living. Viruses are not cellular based. So they're really not living. They may look like they're living, and there's definitely a debate amongst biologists whether or not viruses are living or not. I would err with a classic definition of a cell and say that they're not. They exhibit living characteristics and they can interact with living organisms, but they are not in themselves a living entity. They don't make decisions or anything like that. So cells are going to be our smallest living unit. And it's going to be the cell, the responsibility of the cell to facilitate all functions. And so what I mean by that is the cell facilitates individual individual chemical reactions inside of the cell and can lead towards facilitating things like walking or uh, using your pencil to write. All of, all of those things are because of the function and the action of cells. Now if we apply this specifically to humans, anyone know what type of cells humans have? They're not a lot of hands. Anyone know anything about the types of cells that we have on this planet? There really are two types that you probably been talking about. Okay, animal and plants are actually the same uh, same class of, of cells. I heard it. Karyotes. Yeah, so you have eukaryotes and prokaryotes. What are we? What are humans now? You. <laughs> Okay, so we have eukaryotic cells, and I'm going to help you try to remember this. This literally means with the kernel. And well, I'm not talking about Colonel Sanders here. I'm talking about something that looked like a kernel of corn. So when uh, Robert Hooke and Anton van Leeuwenhoek were first observing cells, they said, oh, a kernel of corn, eukaryotic. And so Humans and animals and plants, when we look at their cells, they have a nucleus plus all of these other organelles that are bound up inside of the membranes. In other words, the functions, things like storing the genetic material, producing energy for the cell, producing proteins for the cell, packaging up those proteins and enzymes, they're, they are um, Bound up in membranes, so they're compartmentalized. Each of those functions is compartmentalized in a eukaryotic cell. They also observed, Lehman Hook and Hook, they observed other cells that were from bacterial origins. And they're like, no, there's no kernel. And so they said prokaryotic, which means pro before the kernel. It's a sort of evolutionary heritage here, but none the same, it works. So when you look at a prokaryotic cell, such as a bacterial cell, you don't see any evidence of <coughs> these compartmentalized organs, organelles. Though. You don't see the nucleus, especially um, in particular the nucleus, because that's the most um, uh, profound of these organelles that we find inside the cell. So humans, you and I, have eukaryotic cells. All of our organelles are membrane-bound. And that's what you can see here. Again, this is called the stereotypical cell. And I want to give you a tour. I want to kind of do the magic school bus thing and give you a tour of the stereotypical cell. And 
And as we go on this tour, we're going to start from the outside of the cell and we'll work our way in. So if you can imagine, we're traveling along. The first thing that we come to in the cell is the cell membrane. And the cell membrane is actually going to be a type of plasma membrane. Now, cell membrane and plasma mem membrane are not necessarily synonymous. Cell membrane is a description of the membrane that surrounds the whole cell. Plasma membrane is a description of the type of membrane that the cell membrane is. All of these other organelles in here also have membranes. They are also types of plasma membranes. Okay? So this is a cell membrane, and it's a type of membrane called a plasma membrane. If we're to zoom in and take a look at that plasma membrane, whether it's the cell membrane or one of the other membranes in the organelle, you can see there's a ton of stuff going on. That plasma membrane has two distinct layers. We call the cell membrane a bilayer. This molecule here, the bluish molecule with the tails sticking down, kind of looks like that. That's called a lipid. That's the type of molecule that it is. Lipids, you think of oil. What happens if I pour, let's say, canola oil onto water? It gets it real well, right? No, it doesn't. It forms two distinct layers, right? The same concept applies here. We take these lipids that are kind of like an oil, kind of like a fat, and if I expose them to water, which is the primary uh, ingredient both surrounding the cell on the outside and then the inside of the cell, I can form a layer. So by having these lipids present, I actually can form this very distinct layer. It actually forms two different layers, and we call those two different layers a bilayer, made up of lipids, so we call it a lipid bilayer. Now you'll also, also notice that there's a bunch of these big red blocks. Anyone know what those are? Those are proteins. And those proteins are what confer physiological function. Everything that you do, whether it's writing, or walking, or running, or thinking, all of that is facilitated by the function of a protein. And there are 200 to 300,000 different proteins that we find in humans. So these proteins that we find bound up in the membrane help to provide additional function for that membrane. And the function is to make that membrane selectively permeable. Okay? So plasma membranes are always going to be selectively permeable lipid bilayers. Selectively permeable lipid bilayers. And if you're ever asked, hey, can you give me a definition of the cell membrane? That's your go-to right there. It's a selectively permeable lipid bilayer. We already sort of understand the bilayer, sort of understand the lipid, but let's expand on the selectively permeable aspect. It comes from the proteins. Permeability just simply means that you can cross through, right? Right now, this wall is not permeable. What do I need to do to make it permeable? Open up the door and make it permeable to students, right? I'm never going to be able to go through this portion of the wall. I don't know if you want to hear what I don't But the wall would be impermeable, right? So that's that's permeable. It just simply means that you can you can cross through. Selectively means that you actually are going to choose when and what can cross that membrane. To wrap around back on this, again, the lipids, typically they're phospholipids. The phospho just refers to the, stuff, to the fact that there's a phosphorus that's typically attached to them. Don't get hung up on that. So that's the lipids. The bilayer is because there's the two distinct layers. And then lastly, it's selectively permeable. So if, it's, if the membrane is permeable, what can it do? It can move stuff inside and out.
So I don't know, I have a glucose molecule here on the inside. If I make the membrane permeable to glucose, that glucose can cross through. If I don't make the membrane permeable to glucose, can the glucose cross? No, it's prevented from crossing. That's the selective nature of the membrane. It chooses what and when that what can cross. Does that make sense? So if I want to allow sodium to cross, I'm going to need a protein that can actually be opened up, just like I would open up the door, to allow that sodium molecule to cross the membrane. To move stuff in and out, again, it's facilitated by proteins. Proteins are what confer physiology. And so we're going to take these proteins, a variety of different types of proteins, and bind them up in the, the bilayer. And then when I need to move something across, I can cause one of those proteins to open up to allow a specific molecule to cross. Now, as a general rule, let's consider a molecule like sodium. You put sodium into water and it ionizes it, which means that it loses an electron. And so the protons have a bigger effect than the electrons. So sodium in a, in a water-based environment, which we would call aqueous, sodium always has a plus, a plus one charge when it's inside of the cell. Anyone know what happens if you take sodium that hasn't lost its electron and you put it into water? Yeah, it's like huge. Like, it's incredible. In fact, I would love to do some of that stuff out here. I think I'd get in a little trouble. So, sodium, this is just one type of molecule that we make you cross. And there's literally tens of thousands of different types of molecules that we can cross. Remember, calcium, potassium, magnesium, glucose. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, all of these other molecules, they need to cross the membrane. Sodium, we would need a protein in the membrane that can open up and it will specifically and only allow sodium to cross. So not only is it selectively permeable, it's really, really specific. And in fact, there are actually dozens and dozens of proteins, specific individual types of proteins, that are used to allow sodium to cross the membrane. So it's not just I have this sodium protein, maybe we'll call it a channel. I actually have many, many different types of sodium channels that allow sodium to cross the membrane. So these proteins, all different types of them, get bound up in the bilayer, and they can be triggered to open or close. By opening or closing them, we're regulating when and what can cross that membrane. Water is another molecule that has to cross the membrane, H2O. And for a long time, in fact, up until about 2000, which really is not that long ago, everybody thought that water just simply crossed right through the membrane. It would be like walking right through the wall, didn't need a protein or anything. And that's sort of true. Water actually can move right through the membrane. There's a couple other molecules that can. Oxygen can move pretty well. Carbon dioxide can move right through the membrane, OK? So the membrane really doesn't have to necessarily select for oxygen or carbon dioxide or for water. But when water moves through the membrane, it moves through really, really slowly. So the time to go through that lipid bilayer to get across from one side to the other, we're talking about 100,000 molecules of water in a second. You're probably going, that's slow. And in terms of biology, that's extremely slow. Water actually also can enter through or exchange across that membrane through a protein specifically called an aquaporin. And there's at least eight different types of aquaporins. So aquaporin 1, aquaporin 2, aquaporin 3. And all of these are proteins that can open up and allow water to cross. Now, once the uh, protein opens up and allows water to cross, it facilitates an increase in speed. Anyone remember what I just said about how fast water moves across directly to the membrane? Slow, 100,000 molecules per second. When I open up a aquaporin, it's now a trillion molecules of water in a second.
sodium, a little bit leaky. Sodium actually will go directly through, and we, and we call it sodium leak. Mm -hmm. But I open up a sodium channel or one of the many different kinds of sodium channels. And it's enough to take the voltage inside of the cell and to go from minus 70 millivolts to plus 35 millivolts in milliseconds. So massive amounts of sodium flow uh, across the membrane is capable because of the proteins that are bound up making the membrane selected and permanent. Now I want to take a, a little detour here real quick, and I want to take two words. Now make sure that you are paying attention to what I'm about to say. Our membranes are selectively permeable. Does anyone happen to know another type of membrane that's out there? It's not a biological membrane. Semi-permeable. These two terms are not equivalent. Selectively permeable is not equivalent to semi-permeable. How many of you have ever looked at uh, osmosis or diffusion through um, dialysis? Have you ever done that experiment before? You put in like a sugar solution on one side and then you can detect the sugar solution on the other side. You put in a fat solution and you can't detect the fat because it's just bigger and you can do it with protein as well. Dialysis tubing is semi permeable. Semi permeable tubing has some characteristic that if you have that characteristic, then you can cross. Typically, it's based off of size. Glucose is a relatively small molecule, so it's small enough to cross through dialysis. Most of our proteins are quite a bit bigger, in fact, really quite a bit bigger. And so they're too big to cross. So dialysis tubing here, a non-biological membrane, would be semi-permeable because it um, discriminates based off of size. However, our biological membranes are selectively permeable because they choose when and what will cross the membrane. So keep these two terms separate in your mind. Do not equate them together. They are not synonyms. Looking back here at our model of the membrane, you can see that there are a bunch of yellow features in there. That molecule is a molecule that you all know, and you probably all think it's a bad molecule. That molecule is cholesterol. Most of you think, oh yeah, cholesterol is bad. Cholesterol is actually not bad. Cholesterol in high levels can be problematic. Cholesterol at an appropriate level will help you to structure your membranes, and it's also the starting point for production of all of our steroids, including testosterone and estrogen. So we have cholesterol that helps to maintain the structure of that membrane. So the structure of the membrane is maintained by cholesterol. Cholesterol is another lipid. It's just a different type of lipid compared to the uh, to the, the phospholipid or the, uh, the lipid that makes up the rest of the membrane, but it still easily interacts with the middle of the membrane, which is primarily where we find the lipid portions of these molecules. Now, with cholesterol, if I have some lipids all stacked together, the closer those molecules get together, we begin to shift in our type of matter, our phase of matter. So I'm talking about gas, liquid, and solid. Optimally, we want our lipids, or our membranes rather, to be sort of liquid-like. Not really too liquid that they flow all over the place, but not solid like butter or lard. Okay? So we want to have this distance between molecules regulated in such a way that it maintains a structure so that it's not too solid, not too liquid, just about right. To optimize function. If a, li if a lipid membrane becomes too solid, it loses all of its function. If it becomes too liquid, it just falls apart and it doesn't hold the cell together. So we sort of have this limit where we want the molecule to be, the molecules of lipids to be spaced apart just enough so that we're kind of in that optimal range in between liquid and solid. All right? If I put cholesterol in here, so this would be without cholesterol, they pack in really tight. This becomes 
more solid. If I put cholesterol in here, so there's a cholesterol molecule, it actually creates a little bit of additional space there. The more cholesterol I put in, the more space that I can actually get. But in addition, the more cholesterol that I put in, or um, depending on the state of the organism, the cholesterol that's required, it's also going to prevent the molecules from becoming too far apart. So the cholesterol holds them apart, but holds them together in the right in the right position. If the lipids uh, just become too loose, they'll spread apart and they become a liquid. How could I do that, by the way? What are, what are, what happens if I throw butter into a hot pan? It turns into a liquid, right? So that butter starts out, and the lipids in that butter are really tightly together. Throw it on that heat source, increase the temperature, they begin to expand apart and they become more liquid. We want to keep the lipid membrane, the, the lipid bilayer, right between those two kind of bookends, if you will, solid and liquid. And so it's good if I can regulate that distance between individual lipids or groups of lipids to help regulate how fluid the uh, membrane is. All right, we'll stop there. All right, remember to go pick up your lab manual. Get that before Friday, and I will see you Friday morning.